Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And if you're like me, this is one of your favorite times of the year. Uh, you know, we came and we did what they call the hanging of the greens. We decorated for Christmas. And starting today, we're going into a Christmas series called It's a Family Tradition. Now, you'll probably understand my theme better at the end, but this morning we're going to be in Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, so you shouldn't have to turn too far. Genesis 38, if you all would, let's all please stand for the reading of God's Word because God's Word is inerrant, God's Word is infallible, and God's Word is inspired. I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Genesis chapter 38. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite named Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son, and named him Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Chesib that she gave birth to him. Judah gave a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife, perform your duty as her brother-in-law, and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he might die too like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. And Lord, we thank you for your many, many miracles and blessings. Lord, I ask that every heart, including mine this morning, be open and be receptive to your word, Father. Lord, we ask that we do nothing else but worship you in spirit with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what a start to a Christmas sermon series, right? In these first 11 verses, we learn quite a bit. Number one, Judah leaves home to hang out with his buddy Hira. Those of you that are younger, buddies will always get you in trouble. It never fails. He starts hanging out with Hira and things go downhill. He went from bad to worse. Leaving the protection of his father and now finds himself married to the daughter of a Canaanite. Well, in our day and age, you know, we don't think much about this. Dating someone outside of possibly our religion or our ethnicity or whatever. But the Canaanites were a different type of people. And believe it or not, God himself prohibited the marriage of the Israelites and the Canaanites. Listen to this, Deuteronomy 7 verses 3 and 4. God says this, he says, you must not intermarry with them, the Canaanites, and you must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will swiftly destroy you. So why did God say, don't marry Canaanites, don't bring them for it's not because God said you're going to bring them to the truth of me. More than likely, God said what's going to happen, they're going to turn you away from me. Now, young people, listen, because only two things can happen when you marry someone that's not a Christian. Either you're going to get them saved, 
or they're going to get you out of church. Now, God says more than likely what's going to happen is they're going to get you away from me. You can say all over and over and over, no, it's not going to happen. I'm telling you what God says. we got to be careful. God warns us. And, you know, as a minister of the gospel, you know, I can marry two saved people. I can also marry two unsaved people. But I can't marry someone that's saved and someone that's not saved because God says when you join together, you can't be unequally yoked. It's not because God's evil. It's because God's watching out for His people. He knows what's best for me and you. Okay, so guess what? Judah didn't listen. He married this Canaanite woman named Shua. She gave birth to three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Judah helps his son Ur find a wife, and her name is Tamar. But Ur was found to be evil, and the Lord put him to death. Now the million dollar question is why? Here's the answer. We don't know. <laughs> We know nothing more, we know nothing less about Ur than that couple of sentences that I just gave you. Okay, so Judah does something that we find strange, right? He goes to the second son, Onan. And he said, Onan, you need to go to your sister-in-law and have a baby. What? That's crazy in our day and age, but... According to the scripture, this is exactly what's supposed to happen. We call it the Leverite marriage. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. This is what God says. When brothers live on the same property and one of them dies without a son, the wife of the dead man may not marry a stranger outside the family. Her brother-in-law is to take her as his wife have sexual relations with her, and perform the duty of a brother-in-law for her. The first son she bears will carry on the name of the dead brother. So his name will not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man doesn't want to marry his sister-in-law, she is to go to the elders at the city gate and say, My brother-in-law refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He isn't willing to perform the duty of a brother-in-law for me. The elders of the city will summon him and speak with him. If he persists and says, I don't want to marry her, then the sister-in-law will go up to him in the sight of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face. Then she will declare, this is what is done to a man who will not build up his brother's house. And his family name in Israel will be the house of the man whose sandal was removed. <laughs> okay. So again, we're getting into strange territory. But the reason Onan was supposed to do what he's supposed to do was for his dead brother. Because if you remember, back in the day that we're speaking of, everyone had an inheritance. Everyone had a right. So this brother who's dead, his name, his legacy needs to be carried on. So Onan was supposed to sleep with Tamar, give her a son, for Ur, and he was going to inherit everything of Ur's. But Onan refused. It says when he slept with her, he spilled his seed on the ground. <clears throat> so Ur's dead, Onan's dead, and Tamar is left alone to grieve her now two dead husbands. She is promised to a third son, Shelah, when he gets of age. So we're looking at Judah's plan. That's point number one. Judah's plan, like mine and your plan, was to see his sons get married, father many babies, but that didn't happen. Judah's plan did not come to fruition the way he would think. Sometimes our plans doesn't work out exactly the way we want or the way that we would want God to bless those plans. And this definitely wasn't Tamar's plan. This young lady married into a great Israelite family, married the eldest son. 
the seat of prestige. God kills him. She gets with his second son. God kills him. And then Judah basically lies to her and says, you know what? Why don't you live in my house until my third son, Sheila, gets of age? Then he'll marry you. But it says in that last verse that Judah, he said, um, uh, he might, Sheila, he might die too like his brothers. So Judah's a little skeptical here. He's trying to figure out what's going on. So Judah had a plan that didn't work out. So let's look at the second part of the story. Tamar's plan. Judah had a plan, so now guess what? Tamar's going to have a plan. Let's look at verses 12 through 23, Tamar's plan. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hira, the Adilamite, went up to Timnah to his sheep shears. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance of Enum, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, Come, let me sleep with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me for sleeping with me? I will send you a young goat for my flock, he replied. But she said, Only if you leave something with me until you send it. What should I give you, he asked. She answered, Your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. So he gave them to her and, sh and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. She got up and left, then removed her veil and put her widow's clothes back on. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite in order to get back the items he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He asked the men of the place, Where is that cult prostitute who is beside the road at Enum? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Adulamite returned to Judah saying, I couldn't find her. And besides, the men of the place said there has been no cult prostitute here. Judah replied, Let her keep the items for herself. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send this young goat, but you couldn't find her. Judah's plan goes from bad to worse. He just doesn't quite know it yet. After his wife's death, Judah finds his old partying buddy and they hit the road again. Some people never learn from their mistakes. If God is fortunate enough to give us a second chance, we shouldn't fumble it like Judah. Judah is not the hero of the story as you're seeing so far. And then tomorrow she says, she was well old enough to be married, but Judah's not sent him to get me. Tamar figures out she's been lied to. William Congreve gives a famous quote. He says, Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell of fury like a woman scorned. Tamar's mad. But Tamar, I'm not going to say wants to get even, she just wants to get what's deserved to her. She married into this family, was promised her children would have a great lineage, and she's been lied to and lied to and lied to by Judah, the patriarch of that family. So Tamar plots her revenge by dressing up like a prostitute, and she seduces her father-in-law. Judah says, what can I leave you? She says, your signet ring, your cord, and your staff. And then um, when the Adulamite shows up, to give her the little goat, she's nowhere to be found. There's never even been a cult prostitute in this area. And Judah finally looks over and says, you know what, just let her keep them. <laughs> We're go I'm going to be the laughing stock of this nation if they find out this prostitute took advantage of me and took my stuff. I'm Judah. I'll just get more. No big deal. It's okay. So hey, 
I sent her to go. I did my part of the promise. So don't worry about it. Most of the world would agree that Tamar's plan was underhanded, but she felt she had to fight for her rights in the family. So, so far, we're learning that Judah's plan didn't work out well, and now Tamar's plan might have been a little conniving. So now we've seen Judah's plan, we've seen Tamar's plan, so let's look at God's plan. The third thing we're going to look at this morning is God's plan. Let's look at verses 24 through 30. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar, now hold on, hold on. Judah in his mind is thinking, I sent this young girl over here. She's supposed to be waiting on Sheila even though I've lied to her. All she's doing is waiting. She's supposed to be respectful and not bring um, bad upon me and my family and upon my reputation. But they tell him, he says, your daughter-in-law Tamar has been acting like a prostitute and now she is pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death. Judah had the authority. Judah had the right. He was the patriarch. This young woman who he told to be faithful and to wait on Sheila has went against his commands. He said, bring her over here. Let me see if this is true. And we're going to burn her to death. As she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I am pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring cord and staff are these? Judah recognized them and said, she is more in the right than I since I did not give her to my son Sheila. And she did not, and he did not know her intimately again. Meaning Judah. He never slept with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first. But then he pulled his hand back, and out came his brother. And she said, what a breakout you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied upon his head, came out and was named Zerah. In this last part, the first thing we see is Judah's anger. Judah had been betrayed. Judah had been lied to. Judah had every right and the authority to put Tamar to death. Tamar was just a little bit smarter than Judah was. She took that signet ring, that cord, and that staff. So when the time came, they were presented to Judah, and he realized that he was more in the wrong than she was. He had put that young woman in a place she never should have been put in. Tamar covered her tracks, and because of that, Tamar was spared. And now we see the birth of Perez and Sarah. You may be asking yourselves this morning, why in the world would David include this in a Christmas sermon series? That's a good question. And if you, if you don't know, this is Genesis 38. Genesis 37 is Joseph Judah's brother being sold into slavery. You got Genesis 38 that we just read. Genesis 39 is Joseph in Potiphar's house. And we know Potiphar's wife lies on him. Da, 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 da. But you see, you got Joseph all the way through. Well, you, okay, to be honest, you've got Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, 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 Judah, Joseph, 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 until he dies. Then we get into Exodus, which is Moses. You get one little chapter here that includes Judah, Tamar, Ur, Odom. And you, why in the world is this chapter even included in the Bible? It doesn't make much sense until you look at the whole of the Bible. 
The first thing we need to realize, the reason this chapter is here, the first reason, is to introduce us to Judah. Judah, like me and you, was not perfect. Judah sinned. But I'm going to be honest with you. And I know that God doesn't put any sin above one or another. But certain men disqualified themselves. And we see that in Genesis. Reuben, I believe it's Dan, and I, I, I don't have this in my notes, but the first several brothers kind of disqualified themselves. And then you get to Judah. And when Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when Jacob is blessing the 12 tribes, because these are the 12 tribes. When Judah's blessing them, he tells them what's going on. And when he gets to Judah, he tells Judah, he said, your name will go on. Your name will be lifted on high. And then when we get to the scripture like Revelation 5.5, 5, listen to Revelation 5.5. 5. It says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seventh seal. Jesus was prophesied back in Genesis to come from the tribe of Judah. So the scripture gives us here Judah. He's telling us this is the lineage. This is what you look for when you're looking for the Messiah. But it gets even better than that. Listen to Matthew chapter 1. And you know when you were little and you would try to read through your Bibles and you'd get to those so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat. You know, I used to just skip those chapters. I mean, they're so boring. Who cares? Those are some of the most important chapters in the Bible. Matthew chapter 1 is the entire genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew is telling his readers, which were um, from Israel, the Jewish nation, he's telling them, this is how we know Jesus is the Messiah. This is the people that Jesus came from. Matthew 1, I'm only going to read the first three verses today. Matthew 1, verses 1 through 3. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, the twelve tribes. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. It's a family tradition. Our Christmas sermon series, we're going to look at the genealogy for the next couple of weeks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, does it start out wild. Like I said, Judah, after everything he did, after all the sin, that, this is the only sin that we've seen him commit. I know he committed others. Look at the place of prevalence he holds in the Scriptures. This morning, have you committed sin in the eyes of the Lord? Absolutely. We all have. Some of us more than others, but like I said earlier, God doesn't like to see him. The Scripture actually tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. This morning, do you know this Jesus that we're celebrating during the Christmas season? This morning, have you been faithful to this King of Kings and this Lord of Lords? This morning, do you have a need of prayer Maybe for yourself. Maybe for someone else. Maybe for the church. This morning, would you like to discuss church membership or baptism? I don't know each heart and mind this morning, but God does. And the only thing I ask 
is that we're obedient to Him and His Word. So if God has stirred your heartstrings this morning, please respond. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You. And Lord, we do thank You. Lord, thank You for giving us Your genealogy. For showing that, just like us, there's a bunch of sinners in Your family tree. Lord, if there's one here this morning and they need to repent of the sin that they're in, Lord, give them the boldness and courage to come forward. Father, we won't laugh at them. We'll rejoice with them, Father. Lord, if there's one here this morning and they have a particular thing on their heart they need to pray for, let them come forward. Father, You know our hearts. You know our needs. Lord, we just have to be faithful and obedient unto You. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you all.